Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday service at Ananda, at the beginning of our wonderful Spiritual Renewal Week. It's a joy to see so many friends and family here from all over the world. My name is Latika, and with me this morning is Nitai, and it's our great joy and pleasure to share our Sunday service with you. I'd like to read from Rays of the One Light. These are weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This is week 32, and the subject is, Does God Hide the Truth? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. In last week's reading, we saw that the great masters themselves counsel discretion in the dissemination of truth. The counter-argument is sometimes made, but the Lord doesn't hide. He reveals his beauty in the sunsets, his tender sympathy in the rain, his wrath in the thunder, his restless energy in the brooks, his power in the sunlight. There are exoteric truths, and there are also esoteric truths. There is that which is revealed impersonally and left up to us to interpret such as the thunder and our perception of it as divine wrath, the rain and our perception of it as God's sympathy. But behind even God's most open expressions, there lies impenetrable mystery. The wind blows where it wills, said Jesus in chapter 3 of the Gospel of St. John. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Sri Krishna says in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, By me the whole vast universe of things is spread abroad. By me the unmanifest. In me are all existences contained, not I in them. God's, God's hidden reality cannot be understood by the reasoning faculty. India's Shankya philosophy states frankly, Ishwar Ashidha, God is not provable. A willingness to seek the underlying reality behind appearances is essential for those who would know God. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om. morning. My name is Nitai. I also welcome you to Spiritual New Week. I think this is number is 40, 41, something like that. <laughs> it's been a long time. A uh, reading this morning from Whispers I want to share with you. <clears throat> I bring to thee the myrrh of devotion. With folded hands, bowed head, and heart laden with the myrrh of reverence, I come to thee. Thou art my parents. I am thy child. Thou art the master. I am ready to obey the silent command of thy voice. I conjured the fragment devotion of all hearts and mixed it with my tears. Now I am eager to wash thy feet in silence. A river of my ardent crystal tears of craving rushes forth to meet thee. Wilt thou see that my boisterous flood of devotion be not lost in the desert of disappointment? Wilt thou see that by mad flood of devotion follow always the right course which leads to thee? <clears throat> so this morning uh, we start with the statement that God cannot be proved. <clears throat> it's a powerful statement, a very in interesting statement, especially for Westerners, although it comes from the Eastern uh, te uh, traditions, texts. Because in the West, we have been trained that truth comes through the intellect and that this intellectual search is the highest kind of search that you can have. 
we have our whole university system based on that premise. And here, right now at Ananda, we have uh, the birth, birthing process of our college here. And one of the cha most, maybe the most challenging aspect of building that college is the fact of trying to understand a new angle on the intellect. We have uh, the Education for Life philosophy, which uh, says there are four tools of maturity. Intellect, one of them, but three others, being the body, the feelings, and the will. And that it's only through the amalgamation of all four of those that we really can attain a real sense of maturity and be ready to experience truth in its fullest um, reality. I thought I would go through a little bit of the journey uh, uh, that I'm most familiar with, um, my own, uh, in dealing with this transition and learning, trying to find out what does it mean that God cannot be proved? There's a uh, kind of a parallel quote that I came across from Albert Einstein. He says, God does not wear his heart on his sleeve. <laughs> and it's, it's about the fact that there is another level of truth that we can aspire to. However, you can't get there immediately. You have to kind of go through this process. Each, each of us have our own process. Mine started when I was, summer I was 19 years old, <clears throat> when I kind of started to wake up. <laughs> um, again, in Education for Life, we talk about four stages of evolution in childhood. The last one being 18 to 24. Some people wake up earlier than that. I woke up a little later. I'm a little bit of a late bloomer. <laughs> but uh, about all of a sudden, I realized some, that summer, I still go back to it. I remember I started to get interested in what is the meaning of things? What's the, what's the purpose of things? And, you know, it started out primarily on that intellectual level because that's all that was available to me from my tradition. I didn't have anything. Uh, I didn't know anything about the Eastern teachings at that point. And um, they certainly... I finally got to one. Uh, my senior year of college, I finally got a course. I decided to take a course on uh, called Oriental Literature and Translation. And that was my introduction to uh, the Bhagavad Gita and um, other spiritual texts from the East. And I remember, it's, you know, I remember clearly, I didn't understand it at the time, but I actually had maybe my only inspiring professor of my whole educational career. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> teaching that course. I, sometimes I tell people what a bad time I had. And other people say, well, I actually enjoyed my education. I think I had a profoundly un, unhappy education, maybe getting me ready to spend my life working at Education for Life and having the motivation. I think it's got to be better than what I had. But anyway, um, I, I think that was one of the very faint few glimmers that I had. But I remember I turned in a paper during that course, and he wrote back, and he said, I appreciate not only the content of what you wrote about, I appreciate the passion that you wrote it with. And I thought, passion? <laughs> In school? <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> wasn't two, two words I'd ever put together before. But uh, looking back on it, I realized he, he, was, he was a wise person. He, had, uh, he was, had his own journey he was on, and he was transmitting it to, the, to us very uh, skeptical intellectuals through his uh, sharing with us the teachings of the East. Um, so I, but mostly going through college, it was I was going through this neti neti process of not this, not that. You know, I happened. I was talking to this young man this morning that left to go to uh, Berkeley Law School, and I was trying to be encouraging. But in the back of my mind, because I, I was at Berkeley, and I was thinking, well, I hope his process is a lot happier and faster than mine, <laughs> because all, you know, at Berkeley you can tra you can sample anything you want to about life and see if it, what it happens. So in that sense, it's a great place to be. Because you can start to say, well, not that one, not that one. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a whole drug culture there, of course, which is now all over the place, but uh, that was very rampant there when I was there. There's a whole, you know, romance uh, aspect of life to delve into in college. There's the whole idea of um, intellectual, you know, kind of chutzpah, which, of course, the, you know, the whole process is all about. Uh, learning that, uh, what was it, I think... Oh, that was, that was one of the you know, little slight turning points. I think, I can't remember if it was Hegel or Hume, but it was one of the people, the philosophers, that they were talking about. Because <laughs> <laughs> at one point I'm studying philosophy, trying to figure out, is that about what life's all about? And I got to the point where we were reading this, I think it was Hume, and he had just proven the fact that the universe does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a little biography. And it said, and as soon as he had proven it, he decided to relax, and he went in the next room to play billiards for a while. <laughs> And I, when I read that, I thought, 
oh, God, <laughs> this is not the kind of truth that I want to know about. But all of it does is it take, takes you back into the billiard parlor after you've gotten to the end of it. Forget it. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not interested. But, so there was that, when I look back now, I think of it is that the beginning of that yearning, that yearning for something else, but it, again, it didn't have a positive focus. It just had a not this, not that. Um, I got to spend a little bit of time in the civil rights movement, and we actually accomplished some things, but there was still, there was still this emptiness inside that I just, I was sitting there in the middle of it, and I think, I should be completely fulfilled. We're actually doing what, you know, this whole mandate of trying to bring, bring out civil rights, and this was in Oklahoma. And I, all I could have to say, you know, maybe it should be that way, but it's not. I just feel empty inside. It's not enough. And so I kept on being propelled on my journey, and from there, started off, I didn't know what else to do when that, that year was up. It was a year's commitment I was doing. So I thought, well, I honestly did not know what to do. I, had, I just sat there and thought, there's no direction I'm being called in. So I thought, well, well I, I can't just sit here in the middle of Oklahoma. <laughs> I have nothing to do. I'll just start traveling. So I started traveling and um, ended up going east. I didn't know why I went east, actually, but I just kind of thought, well, that's a probably a good direction to go. So I started off. It, I made it, wanted to make it dramatic, of course. Divine Mother got to play a dr dramatic uh, chapter here. So I started off in Morocco and then uh, went through southern Europe. And I, by the time I got to Italy, I'd been traveling for about a month. And that was starting to wear off, too. And I was getting desperate because <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, if traveling is going to be just as boring as everything else, what do you do then? <laughs> <coughs> so I, w I remember going, I was in Rome, and I went to a bookstore to find something to read just to distract myself. So there was a book in the bookstore. It was, uh, it was a collection of stories and writings about R Ramakrishna. And I'd played around, you know, when I was in college, I'd played around with the idea of the Eastern things. Um, I had that one course. I actually got to uh, meet um, Maharishi. He was, when he just first arrived in the West, he was giving a little satsang at Berkeley. There was about six of us there. Nobody knew who he was. And I thought, oh, he's a really sweet little man. I really like him, but I wasn't ready to commit. <laughs> or get it, jump into the, on the bandwagon. So I was just kind of passed. Uh, there was another teacher in Berkeley at the time called I Ignath Ishwaran, a uh, wonderful man. And um, I was really thought, wow, he seems so noble. I'd, I'd like to go hear him talk. And that was a big step to go hear a spiritual teacher talk because I wasn't thinking of myself as spiritual. I was still reacting from being raised as a Catholic. <laughs> um, a little, little sidelight before I get, I'll get back to that. <clears throat> <laughs> I ran across this little saying the other day. It said, religion is for those who are afraid of hell. <coughs> Spirituality is for those who have already experienced it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was working my way through that. <laughs> so I thought, but no, I want to go hear this man talk. I, you know, he just seems like a, such a fine man. So I, went, I made, went there, I went to the talk that night, and he spent the whole evening talking about why you shouldn't smoke. And <laughs> And smoking was not one of my issues, so I just sat there dumbfounded, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> another dead end. And as I came out, I asked people, I said, does he always talk? She's, and this lady says, he's never talked that way before. <laughs> I don't know why he talked that way tonight. But anyways, my karma, just to say, oh, that door is not going to open. That's because I was not going to go back there. So anyway, um, I got to, the, you know, to, to Rome to pick up the story again, and I read the book about Ramakrishna, and I just started to think, oh, there's something here. There's something here that just calls to me on some level that I don't, it's not, it wasn't an intellectual level. It was a, a feeling level, a, a heart level. And I thought at that point, okay, I'm going to keep going east. I'm going to go to India and I'm going to find out how to meditate. So it was the start of a positive process, the first particular start. But I actually had tried to meditate a little bit earlier. I remember I, when I was in Oklahoma, I got a book on um, Zen Buddhism, and had a, it was actually an excellent book, Three Pillars of Zen, and it had a little thing on how to meditate in there, but, and so I tried to study it really hard and try to figure out how to, how, what do you do with your sitting here, and you're doing this with your breath and your eyes, and I gave myself these really bad headaches in the process, because I didn't know what I was doing, and I just, I didn't have a teacher, I just was kind of stumbling around in the dark, and so I thought, well, I've tried meditation, but then, I don't know, the Ramakrishna thing was enough to get me to keep going, I didn't have any place else to go. So uh, I got to go on this very dramatic trip, went through Turkey and Iraq, no, 
not Iraq, Iran, and um, I'm just kind of moving along, going going east, and um, I was on this bus in northern Iran um, one day, and it was actually a several day trip because it, it's a vast country. There's hardly anything up there, and um, well, this fir one first day I was on the bus was kind of fun, just a sidelight that it got to be sunset, <clears throat> and the bus stopped in the middle of the desert. And I thought, what's going on? And everybody got out of the bus. Everybody turned toward Mecca <laughs> and bowed down <laughs> and did their namaz. <laughs> and I was standing there thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm in a different place. But <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of, I was the only you know, person from the West on the bus. And um, so it just kind of, I think it primed the pump though. It just kind of got, shook me. It's like, wow, you're really not in the West anymore. You're really out of your frame of reference. And so the next day we're traveling along and just spontaneously, I had this experience of oneness. And it just came, I don't know where it came from. I mean, I, I know now that it came from my guru, but at that point I had no reason to think it was gonna come. I wasn't doing anything special. I was sitting on the bus, just traveling through this countryside. And there was, I remember there was some, um, you know, Iranian music on the, on the bus and people were talking in a you know, language I couldn't understand. So I was very isolated in that sense. But it was so powerful that it changed the whole direction. Because now, from that experience, I, when that happened, I don't know, I can't remember how long it happened, long enough to make a, a life-lasting imprint on me. And I said, that's it. <laughs> that experience is worth everything. It's worth going anywhere. It's worth doing anything. Because that experience is just exactly what I was looking for, not knowing about it. And I know. You know, Master Divine Mother comes to each of us in our own way. That was the way that she came to me. And at that point, I always thought, yes, India, ho! <laughs> you know, we're going to go there. We're going to find a, find out how to meditate So, because i, I got to have this. i got to have this as much and as often and as deeply as I possibly can. So uh, after going through Afghanistan, which was a fascinating country even then, there was... Uh, <laughs> there were no motors <laughs> in the country at that point, as far as I could tell. Everything was oh, animal drawn. Um, but going in and getting to getting finally to New Delhi through all the challenges of travel, and so I thought, okay, here I am, New Delhi. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to find my spiritual path. <clears throat> so I go. I went out and um, just started walking around downtown New Delhi, <laughs> and. Uh, I looked around and there was this man that was standing there and he, he had a kind of a long white beard and he had some robes on. I, I can't remember what color they were, maybe they were orange, I'm not sure. I didn't know that that was the Swami colors at that point. And so I, he, I looked at him and he looked at me and thought, oh wow, well, maybe this is it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all of a sudden we're talking together and he starts, starts to tell me, he says, would you like me to tell you your life, uh, life story and your life, your future? And I said, Oh, okay. I, you know, I wasn't really looking for that, but I was looking at how to, how to meditate. But if that's what he wanted to talk about, then that's what I would go with. So he started telling me about my future. <coughs> and, um, but then he stopped after about five minutes and he said, um, could you give me 30 rupees for that? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's a little strange, but okay, here, 30 rupees. And so then he started telling me more about my life. And then he stopped again and about now, you know, a few minutes later, he said, um, about 50 rupees now. <laughs> and so about the third time he got to me, he started asking me for more money. I thought, oh, no, <laughs> no, no, this can't be. This is, a, this, oh, what a, what a ripoff. And uh, so I just said goodbye. <laughs> and I walked away and go back to my usual sense of desperation and emptiness back where I was living, where I was living. But I happened to be rooming with a guy from the, from, uh, Cal from uh, at least the United States. And so he, I, he, I came in, and I must have looked completely distraught. And he, he just looked at me, and he says, what's going on? He says, I said, oh, he said, I just so, I don't know what to do. He says, I just, I'm interested in how to meditate. I, I have no idea how to find a meditation teacher. I'm just completely helpless. I don't know where to go. <laughs> this is my version of a prayer at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so he looked at me, and he just said, you know, he says, I read this book over in, when I was in California. He said, and... It's really a powerful book. I almost stayed in California when I read it, but then I decided to come here um, instead. But he said, the book's called Autobiography of a Yogi. And I said, okay, 
all right, <laughs> I'll get the book. And so I walked downtown New Delhi, and I found a bookstore. And I, I don't think it, I don't know if it was really this way or if it was just my imagination. But I, I, the way I remember it is I walked in, and the book was staying, standing in the very front, of the, right inside the door, the first thing I saw when I went in there. And so I bought the book. And the book is, <laughs> it magnifies this thing that God cannot be proved because here I am. I'm still a skeptical Westerner. And there's Lahiri appearing in the meadow on page eight. <laughs> and there's the, you know, the healings that are happening and all the miracles. But at that point, I had enough to not really be bothered by it because it was so foreign to me. The whole idea of miracles, you know, the whole idea of I was raised with all these miracles that Jesus did that, you know, I, by the time I got to be 18 or 19, I just thought, what a bunch of junk. <laughs> and because um, nobody could do anything even remotely similar. You know, they would talk about it, but it was all something that happened 2,000 years ago. So anyway, uh, but I had that, that yearning that had been cultivated, that Divine Mother was cultivating through the experiences that said, um, that's okay, I don't understand it, but there's something there, there's something there that's resonating on that deeper level. And so I made that commitment. I said, you know, I started, I, I started with the um, and page about page, I don't know, 100 or so. By page 100, I was reading the book just, you know, glued to it. There was nothing else I wanted to do. So by page 100, I said, okay, I'm staying in India the rest of my life. I'm going to find this man's ashram, and I'm going to uh, live here, and that's it. <laughs> so I kept reading, and by page 250, I realized that he'd gone to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and not only that, he ended up in California. So <laughs> I was born in Sacramento. And... Um, <clears throat> And there's another part of the story I won't go to into, but you know, all of a sudden I found out that Swami Kriyananda had started this place up in Nevada City, which was 70 miles from where I was born, <clears throat> and that I would end up there uh, for the rest of my life, um, which was much kinder on my family, the fact that <laughs> the ashram was here in Nevada City instead of in Hardwar or someplace like that. <clears throat> but it's that, that process that, that God takes us through that you know, first we don't we have to go with what we have and at first we just have our egos and we're just we're, we're kind of we're trapped inside of them you know you master talks about when he reincarnates putting on that overcoat on a, on a hot summer day the feeling that that you know for him i mean for us it's a lot deeper than that we just we get locked into this ego which is like these chains come up and grab you and you stick you in this thing so you think you're a, you're a man or a woman or you think you're intelligent or you think you're artistic or all these different things you think you are and you're stuck <laughs> but so what do you do you have to use it you use that ego and you start to look at life and you start to say okay what's going on here and of course you know we've all been on this journey a long time um we wouldn't be here today we've, we've checked out a lot of things that didn't work didn't didn't have that sense of fulfillment but that that innate yearning process got stronger and stronger to the point which is <clears throat> I think I'd say my ego got me to New Delhi, <laughs> and I, I appreciate it, that, that, that part of it. Everything after Delhi was trying to get rid of the ego. <laughs> it was like seeing that, okay, now the ego's the thing that's in the way. How do, what can I do to dissolve it, to, to lessen that group, to unlock these chains, to realize that I'm not, I'm not this ego, that my reality is, is, is the universe. My reality is oneness with the spirit. You can't get there from the ego. <laughs> There's no, it's like, you can't get there from here. It's impossible on its own because the ego is already defective in its, it's narrow, it's limited in its, in, its, in its essence. So how can it ever embrace infinity? It's impossible, just no way. So you can spend a few days or incarnations realizing that and you finally realize that I need help. And that's when you start to look for the guru. You start to say, there's gotta be something else and the guru, what is the guru? The guru is just the embodiment of God in a way that you can relate to, in a way that you can connect with on the material plane, which is where we all start from. And it's that connection. But you can't work with the guru unless you you can't work effectively with the guru unless you've gone a long way towards letting go of the intellectual traps and the thing that God has to be proved and all these other things that come up because the guru can't be proved either. <laughs> It's, it's not on an intellectual level. It's not on a reasoning level. It's on a heart level. It's on a feeling level. And when that 
when you can tune into the guru on that level, then you can start the second phase of the journey. You can start the phase where your, your being starts to very slowly starts to resonate with the guru's being. It's kind of like a clutch in a car that, you know, you got the motor spinning here and you got the wheels spinning here and you got to get that clutch where it joins the two energies together harmoniously. Well, it's a little rocky first. It's like learning how to ro- use a stick shift at first. You know, the car lurches all over the place because boom, boom, you, know, you just keep bouncing off because you don't, you're not in tune with the guru. But if you do the work, it starts to, it starts to be more and more comfortable and the car starts to take off more and more smoothly and your life starts to go more and more smoothly. So it's that process of opening up, opening up to the guru in every single aspect of your life. <laughs> because everything that's not connected with the guru is still connected to ego. And so whenever you find yourself grumping about the guru or the teachings, look at what's grumping. <laughs> look at and see it. That's the part you're trying to get rid of. Don't, don't identify with it. Don't claim it. I mean, you can. We do. But it just extends the process. It lengthens out the journey. It makes for more pain. And who wants to do that? <laughs> you know, so what we're here for Spiritual Renewal Week is to say, now I want to take the next step. I want to just use the inspiration of this week. To, so I don't, I, next Sunday at this point, you don't want to be where you are right now. <laughs> you want to be beyond it. You want to have moved a big step forward you know, from this, this week. You want to be able to commit yourself more deeply to your guru. And you want to be able to sense that oneness with the guru in on, on a much more broader and more expansive way. I found a little quote that I wanted to close with. <clears throat> this is from Essence of Self-Realization. <clears throat> see, which one is it? Whoops, wrong page. <clears throat> These are, this is Master speaking and Swami remembering. <clears throat> Words are incapable of conveying the fullness of an idea or perception. Listen to my words, but try also to tune in to the deeper meaning behind them. I prefer magnetizing you with my thoughts to teaching you outwardly through words. For only when I can touch you from within, in your consciousness, do I know that you have grasped my true meaning. Adiom Tatsat.